Hey yo, from the kingdom of Ohio, you are listening to the O'Culture Podcast. I'm your host, Ryan Beverly. Welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. And as we know by now, good art is timeless. And the man whose name is on the marquee for this one published a book 15 years ago with a message that I think is just as strong today as it was when it first came out. That man's name is Brad Warner, and he's the author of six books, including the critically acclaimed hardcore zen, punk rock, monster movies, and the truth about reality. This book put Brad on the map in the Buddhist community because of its no-nonsense, plain-spoken, and maybe even outspoken approach to zen, meditation, and the nature of individual reality. In fact, hardcore zen actually begins with these words... Quote, nothing is sacred. Doubt in everything is absolutely essential. Everything, no matter how great, how fundamental, how beautiful or important it is, must be questioned. End quote. So you know that yours truly, what with my plain spoken mantra recited at the end of each episode, you know that this is right up my anti-dogmatic, anti-authoritative alley. The only question now is, is it up yours? Okay, that sounded a bit odd. What I mean is, let's see how much this chat resonates with you, or if it resonates at all. Either way, I think you'll get something from it. Brad Warner is in the house right after this. The time has come to unshackle the beast that you have feared for so long. Relinquish your fear and submit to the cause. You will find all you need in these audio recordings. The year is 1990. Welcome to a culture. So, Brad Warner, thanks for taking the time, man. Really appreciate you being here. No problem. Hello. How are you? Oh, I'm doing great, man. I'm doing great. Thanks for asking. So, you know, you're a fellow Ohio native. I don't know if I mentioned that to you in our emails, but I live in the Dayton, Ohio area right now, and you're also from the uh, the Buckeye State, as it's known. Always nice to chat with someone who's familiar with the terrain, if you know what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, <laughs> yeah. Dayton, yeah. huh? Yeah, yeah. I never went. I don't think I've ever actually been to Dayton itself, but my grandparents were from Cincinnati, so I've been around that part of right. it. Right. Yeah, yeah. Well, area. you're not missing much if you haven't been to Dayton, so that's <laughs> totally cool. I guess we may touch on the Ohio thing and how it sort of formed you growing up, but you're actually here because, in my perspective, you're one of the more outspoken members of the Buddhist community, both in America and worldwide, I think. And I Am dig I? that. I well, I don't know. Just it's just what I've heard about you, I guess. And like again, we can talk about that. But I dig your style, and I have to say that after reading and then rereading your first book, Hardcore Zen, which was published 15 years ago, I mean, it hasn't aged a bit. And as a non-Buddhist, I've found a hell of a lot in common with that book and the way that you think, just in terms of the way that I've been processing my reality recently. And well, that's good. To, yeah. Yeah. I, I it was my first book, it was my first published book. I wrote some books before that. I couldn't get published and I've written five more since then published five more since then about Zen it's become a career I I didn't 
I didn't know what to expect when I when I wrote that, but it's it's become my thing, <laughs> much to my surprise. Yeah, yeah, and we'll get a lot in a lot more into that uh, to your approach to this Zen thing here soon. But you know, I need that Buddhist origin story. Where and when and how were you introduced to this? Well, it's a story I've told a bunch of times, and if you read Hardcore Zen, you read it, but your listeners probably didn't. I was a student at Kent State University. I was also the bass player for a hardcore punk band called Zero Defects, and this is the early 1980s. And I'd gotten into punk rock because I was kind of frustrated with the with the sort of climate of the times or, or whatever. It just didn't seem like there was much truth out there. And and being a musician, I I wanted something, music that spoke to me, that, that said something vital. And it seemed like there was a lot to say and nobody was saying it. So I got into the punk rock scene and I was also a student at Kent State and I just signed up for this class called Zen Buddhism on a whim. I'd had a few experiences. I grew up partly in Africa, in Nairobi, Kenya. So there was a big Hindu population there, and some of my dad's friends were, were Hindu, so I was kind of aware that there were these other religions out there other than Christianity and that they might be interesting. But I didn't really expect much from this class, and it just turned my, my whole head around. I, I thought that Zen Buddhism took what I was interested in in the punk rock scene to its logical conclusion, which was not just to question society and and question the status quo and all of that, which it was doing, but to kind of go further than that and turn those questions in upon yourself and then say, well, what am I? And, and you know, what what is my role in all of this? And, and what is reality at its ultimate root? And, and Buddhism, just Zen Buddhism particularly, seemed very logical and sensible. You know, it, w- it wasn't like a religion in the sense of, of trying to give me a belief system that I that I could hang on to, you know, saying that it's like this, this, and this, and you have to believe these things. It was more a method for investigating what was actually true, which was this weird seated meditation practice in which you kind of just do nothing for hours at a time, <laughs> yeah. which might seem counterintuitive, but I thought that that seemed to me like the best way to 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 see what reality actually was, was by kind of just facing it. Did you see any parallels when you got into Buddhism with the mentality of punk rock? You know, because that has its sort of own DIY ethos, counterculture, you know, kind of do whatever you want. Did you see any parallels there? Well, there were some. I mean, it, it, it took the questioning approach, which punk had. The The sort of the brand of punk I got into was what was kind of going on in Akron at the time. It was very, I guess people called it political, but it wasn't necessarily political in the sense of being partisan. It was more about things and about looking into things rather than the sort of party punk, which 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 I realized later was also going on, but I wasn't really interested in it, you know, where, where people just got loud and crazy just for the sake of it. This was kind of a, a very serious sort of punk. And, and so I, I found that a, a kind of parallel to that. A lot of the people I knew in that scene were interested in big questions, you know, rather than just kind of playing in these shallow waters of, of I don't know, getting drunk and having a good time. They were kind of investigating these big questions. So there was that parallel. And, and then, of course, all the punk rockers shaved their heads and all the Buddhists also shaved their heads and wore black. Mm-hmm. And so... I thought that was kind of funny. I still think that's kind of a funny intersection of the two cultures. I will say this, though. What's been funny to me about this is is these days it seems almost, I don't know if it's exactly, but it's almost a cliche to, to see a, a connection between punk and Buddhism. I mean, there's there's certainly a bunch of people who are saying this and not just me. But what was interesting to me is when I wrote Hardcore Zen, I thought I had written a completely unpublishable book because I had never, I'd been studying Zen for 15 or 20 years by then, and I had never once encountered even one single person who saw any connection between punk and Buddhism. So I was I was surprised as hell when, uh, when a publisher wanted to publish that thing because I thought, <laughs> there's no market for this. Well, I was wrong. <laughs> Yeah, you know, and what I guess led to the publication of that book because or I guess the the why did you write it exactly because 
I've not read anything like it. You know, I picked up Buddhist texts before, and I flip through them at the bookstore or the library, and what I get from those is it's unlike what I get from your book. So I guess, did you see a uh, opportunity to really come out and be honest and straightforward about what Buddhism really is, as opposed to, you know, what that sort of pop culture or pop spirituality narrative of it is? Well, there was a little bit of that, yeah. You know, it, personally, writing that book, it, as I mentioned, I'd written books before, and I kind of wanted to be an author. I was living in Japan. I was working for this uh, film and television production company, which specialized in monster movies. And I had this, you know, secret desire to be a writer. And I had two teachers, two Zen teachers by then, both of whom had said, you should write a book about Buddhism. And I thought, oh, I can't write a book about Buddhism. But when when I realized my other books weren't getting published, I just kind of sat down and wrote this very straightforward, honest book about how Zen Buddhism had been in my life, thinking the entire time that I was writing to nobody. I, I had this kind of vague idea that my nephew, who was then 14 years old and interested in spiritual questions and deep questions, might read it. And I thought maybe I could Xerox it and, and make it like a zine out of it, you know, and, and sell it at, I don't know where I would sell it, wherever you sell zines. <laughs> I, I didn't imagine that it was going to be a book, which gave me a tremendous amount of freedom to just say whatever I wanted. And, and part of it was railing against the whole commercial spirituality thing, which I think is, is kind of sad, uh, because there are a lot of people with real questions and, and real concerns who are getting led into things by people who basically just want to take their money and, and offer them some platitudes which I think is kind of rotten, but, uh, you know, so, so I was kind of speaking out against that, but not thinking I was going to get heard by anybody. <laughs> well, I kind of see that now still. I mean, I guess maybe it never stopped. It's maybe just gotten more obvious with, you know, social media and the greater internet culture. But in the 15 years since you wrote that or since you published that, and now, I mean, have you seen that same trend? Has it grown from, from your perspective, this, oh, yeah. this sort of pop spirituality? Oh, yeah, yeah. It's huge now. It, it's, uh, you know, it's it's kind of been there for a long time, you know, at least since the 60s, it sort of uh, kind of blossomed as a, as a thing. But especially in terms of Buddhism, when I first started getting interested in Buddhism, there was no sort of cool factor attached to being a Buddhist. You know, there was there was nothing as far as any of my friends in the punk scene were concerned. If you'd asked them, I, I kept it secret that I was getting into Buddhism because I thought they'd just laugh at me because this, this was just kind of old hippie garbage that we'd all discarded, you know, and, and seen through. And since the time of that book, it's, it's become gigantic. It's become this, this market which, which attracts a lot more people who are just in it to, to make some cash. You know, and, and I don't want to make it sound like they're all totally crass, but I think there's a kind of a tendency... There's, there's people who are in it just to kind of make some money and they don't know what the hell they're, they're talking about. And then there's this kind of other realm of people who are probably sincere, but they, they're overstepping. You know, they really, they really haven't got a grounding in what they're talking about yet, but they're ready to go, you know. And, and so they, they kind of uh, crowd out the, the good stuff often on the bookshelves. Yeah, they certainly do. I mean, maybe guys like, uh, well, we won't name names. But, <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, hey, I'll tell you, my introduction to Buddhism was through the uh, novels of Jack Kerouac, the old beaten yeah. writer, who turns out to be a piece of shit, really, as a person when you really <laughs> get into him. So he probably wasn't like an actual Zen Buddhist. But, you know, the concepts in his work when I was reading it in college was what really turned me on to it the first time. And I didn't really get into it that much, and I didn't deep dive into it, and obviously I don't practice it now. But the ideas were there, in my mind anyways. Mm -hmm. And I think you were introduced to it, though, through a whole other medium, television, right? Well, hmm, I guess in a way. I mean, I was I was a big fan of this show called Ultraman, which was they were produced by the company that I ended up working for in Japan. It was a Japanese superhero show, not a cartoon, but live action with guys in costumes and giant monsters and stuff. And there was a scene in there where they were chanting the Heart Sutra. And I didn't know at the time it was a Heart Sutra. I just figured that out later when I watched it again as, a, as an adult. But, uh, but that, was, that was a 
big thing. And, uh, you know, I, I, there wasn't much else. Like, when I took that class called Zen Buddhism, all I really knew about Buddhism or Zen Buddhism was it, I knew Buddha was Indian, and I knew that it was a long time ago, and I knew that Zen was a Japanese thing. And that those are probably all I could have told you about it. So I, 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 I came very fresh to it. And I had this very good teacher named Tim McCarthy who was just, I don't know, not everybody thinks Tim is brilliant, but I thought he was a brilliant uh, person to uh, explain Buddhism in, in a way that I could make sense out of it. Well, I was hoping that you could explain Buddhism to us in a way that we could make sense out of it. And oh, I think boy. that we should, I know, I think that we should start, though, with, just the concept of Zen, you know, what, what is yeah. Zen to you? Well, you know, I'm always, I get asked that question a lot and I always feel like people are hoping for this kind of beautiful answer, which I'll say, Zen is the plum tree in your mind or some silly thing like that. But I, I usually go for a historical explanation. Zen, Zen is just, it's the Japanese pronunciation of a word that originated in India, a dhyana, which basically means meditation. So literally, Zen Buddhism means meditation-based Buddhism. Buddha was an Indian guy 2,500 years ago who taught meditation to people. I mean, that this is his main claim to fame. And there's all sorts of branches of Buddhism out there who see Buddha differently. But most forms of Buddhism are in agreement that Buddha was not a god or anything like that. He was a person like all of us but that he was a sort of genius in, in terms of what we might call spirituality, in that he, was, he, he discovered this very direct path of understanding the, the true nature of life, the universe, and everything. And the Zen form of Buddhism as a distinct form of Buddhism probably uh, appeared in China about 500 years after Buddha died. And it was a kind of movement that may have originated in northern India of people who were trying to get back to the essence of Buddhism, which had kind of diverged away from meditation and away from the, the practices that, that the Buddha actually did. So they wanted to kind of bring it back to that. You know, that's it, that's it in a nutshell. I mean, there, there are more books, apparently, allegedly, about Buddhism than there are any other religion. And one of the reasons might be because there's no established canon like there is in Christianity or Judaism or, or um, Islam in the sense of there isn't a fixed set of books that are considered to be the books of Buddhism, which means anybody can write a book of Buddhism. And if it's accepted by the wider population of Buddhists, then then that's that's all you need. <laughs> so So there's a huge amount of literature out there. Yeah, in, in Hardcore Zen, you actually, and tell me what you mean by this phrase, but you defined it, I guess, in a roundabout way as the complete absence of belief. What do you mean by that exactly? Yeah, uh, let's see, what did I mean by that? <laughs> it's been a while. <laughs> I, I think of it as, you know, belief is what drives most religions. And, and people will argue about this, and I understand those arguments, but if you really kind of come down to it, when you encounter a religion, probably the first question is, what do you guys believe? You know, and you'd say, well, we believe this, this, and this, and they'll, they'll tell you uh, exactly what they believe. And, it, and the beliefs are the religion. So, you know, the belief in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ is, is Christianity. Buddhism isn't like that. There isn't a sense that there are certain things you have to believe in order to be a Buddhist. Uh, of course, this varies from different forms of Buddhism. But I think generally speaking, it's safe to say that this is a common to, to most forms of Buddhism that you don't, it doesn't matter what you believe. It doesn't matter if you believe that Buddha did this or that or the other thing or that, that you're supposed to just test it for yourself and see if it's true. It's just kind of being offered there. So you're asked to let go of your beliefs, to to not necessarily stop believing anything that you already believe, but to not hold them so tightly and and allow allow the truth to appear as it is, regardless of whether it fits what you believe or not. Yeah, and that ties back to the 
the punk rock mentality, I think, you know, with the whole question everything, but also, you know, not sort of blindly conforming to society or to any sort of belief structure to really just, I guess, you know, remain open-minded. I don't know. I'm just kind of rambling here at this point, but uh, it, <laughs> well, yeah, it, it's still a very punk rock thing. Yeah. 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 And in, in, in that it has a lot of commonality because it's kind of, it, it's a bit of, I don't know, tough love. I know that's probably not the word, but this kind of a- attitude to where you're going to accept the truth, whether the truth is to your liking or not to your liking. So there's not this kind of comforting set of of beliefs. You know, for example, a lot of people are attracted to Buddhism these days because they're interested in this idea of reincarnation when they think Buddhists believe in reincarnation. But things like reincarnation are sort of offered by Buddhists as possible explanations, but not as a belief system. So there's no kind of this is what will happen after you die if you do X, Y, and Z which most religions offer. It's, it's sort of like, this is how to live in this world. And if there is a next world, then we would expect the same sort of rules to apply. So maybe it'll do you some good in your next world, in your next life, if there is such a thing. But we're not worried about that. We're worried more about how to live this life. The idea being that if there is any cosmic truth, it's not out there somewhere else. It's not going to appear to you at the moment of your death or something like that. If it's going to appear to you at all, it's as likely to appear to you on, you know, Thursday afternoon at 3.30 than it is, you know, in some cosmic special moment. Well, that is something that surprised me about the Buddhist, let's just call it tradition, since it's not a belief system or a religion necessarily. Mm. What surprised me about Buddhism is that from those commercial spiritual Buddhist texts, they, they make it seem like uh, reincarnation and rebirth are sort of like central tenets to Buddhism. Mm. And I didn't really gather that from the way that you wrote about them, that it's not really a... I mean, I, I guess it's a common narrative, but it's not really like... It's a misperception that a lot of people have of it, right? Yeah, well, it's it's arguable that that this is central to it because there's there's an idea of karma, which is I mean everybody's sort of familiar with the the sort of low level idea of karma, which is you reap what you sow in, in Christian terms. You know, you what you do kind of comes back to you and all of that. But uh, but karma is the idea that there's no action without a reaction. But it goes deeper than that. Anyway, the the people who believe in this kind of I don't know. I think of it as kind of dopey level of karma will say that if you don't believe in rebirth or reincarnation, then there's no karma because you could do terrible things in this life and then die and nothing happens to you. You know, you have to have that rebirth where you get, you, you know, you get to experience the, the terrible things that you did. I don't think that's necessarily so. I, I think what you experience, you experience as much in this life as you would in any uh, life to come. Uh, and that and the karma operates immediately. And it, it's not always evident. But I feel like what happens if you follow a Buddhist path is your eyes become open to how it works. And you start seeing that Oh my gosh, the the karma that I put out now is is having effect now. Uh, so it, it doesn't it doesn't mean you have to believe in in those things. And and I think a lot of Buddhists within the Zen school hold their belief in rebirth and reincarnation very lightly. The uh, Dainin Katagiri or not Dainin Katagiri, he's a good one too, but Shohaku Okumura is one of these guys who's writing some good books about Zen these days. And I wish I could give you a chapter and verse quote from his books. But he says something interesting, like uh, like he's been a Buddhist way longer than I have. He was born into it in Japan, and, and he became a priest at an early age or a monk. And even he looks at, at reincarnation and says, well, you know, if it happens, well, I hope I'm hoping for the best, but I'm not sure. <laughs> you know, and, and so I, that that's the kind of Zen attitude is to kind of say, well, yeah, maybe, but I'm not going to I'm not going to concern myself with that so much as I'm going to concern myself with living ethically 
in this moment for the sake of living ethically in this moment rather than saying oh i hope i don't get reborn as a crab so i'm not gonna i don't know pee on my neighbor's lawn or something <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah. i don't think that's a great basis for morality anyway speaking of japan i wanted to go back to when you moved there uh in your younger mm -hmm. days did you move there for that job or did you go there previous to that in hopes of maybe landing that job or something like it well i i was a uh, i'd graduated from college i i and ended up graduating from university of illinois if that's matters but anyway I graduated and I had a teaching certificate and I was trying to get jobs as a teacher and I was also putting out records. I started this band slash project called Dementia 13. I was the only sort of continuing member of Dementia 13 and sometimes I was the only member of Dementia 13. But I made a bunch of records and but they weren't making any money and I wasn't seeing any sort of possibility of that happening. So my sister told me about a program in Japan that hired people to be English teachers, and I just went, oh, Japan, you know. I, I was more interested in the Japanese monster movie culture than the Zen culture, because my teacher, my Zen teacher in America, had told me from his Zen teacher, who was Japanese, that it, it was really not that great <laughs> in Japan. Uh, it was it was a place where Zen had come from, but that most Japanese people weren't interested in it, and the temples kind of functioned as more of a social gathering place than uh, a place to study the true meaning of reality. So, so I just went there for a job, and I, I taught English for a year, and then I got a job working for this this program, or this uh, television and film production company that made Ultraman this great uh, cheesy superhero show and, and a lot of movies with giant rubber monsters attacking Tokyo. And, and I, I found a Zen teacher there almost by accident because long about the second or third year I was in Japan, I realized, I guess it must have been the second year, that I was just going to stay. And if I wanted to pursue the Zen thing, I ought to find a Japanese Zen teacher. And I knew that would be difficult, but I happened to to more or less stumble upon this guy named Gudo Nishijima, who taught these classes on Saturday afternoons at the Tokyo uh, Tokyo University, which is a kind of an important university in Japan. It's sort of like the Ivy League University of, of Japan, and it, they'd, uh, he'd graduated from there and was able to use one of their rooms as a, as a kind of classroom on Saturdays to teach these classes about Dogen and about Zen. And so I just wandered in and, and had a look, and, and he became my teacher. So yeah, going to Japan was more economical. I, I, wasn't, I wasn't going there to study Zen because I already knew it wasn't a great place to study Zen. And when people ask me that these days, I get asked fairly often, like, how do I go study Zen in Japan? And I go, oh, you're probably better off wherever you are <laughs> than, than trying to do it in Japan, yeah, unfortunately. That's just the, the way it is over there right now. Yeah, well, while you were over there, you had an interesting experience walking along the Sangawa River. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, yeah, that one's a hard one to talk about because, and, and even though I've talked about it a lot, it's still hard. I had been practicing Zazen for, you know, I don't really know exactly how long, but well over 10 years, maybe close to 20 years by then, and... You know, it started early, so I was in my mid thirties, I guess. And and I there was this route I took every day to work, which uh, led along the Sengawa River, which is this little tiny river that runs through Tokyo, a little almost more like a creek with walls than a river. And there was a little bridge that I crossed every day. And the the experience or whatever it was started at the when I stepped onto the bridge and was sort of finished by the time I stepped off. And this is not like a, you know, Brooklyn bridge type bridge. This is like a, you know, the, like crossing a road sort of, you know, it's not as about that long as, as it would take you to cross a, a two lane road. And it was a very strange experience that at all at the same time felt perfectly normal, even though it was the weirdest thing that ever happened in my life. You know, that's why it's hard to talk about. It was it was sort of like going, oh, that's the way it is. And it was totally surprising. But it 
it was it, it it all also confirmed a lot of the things I'd been studying in in Zen texts for for years about the nature of reality, which which has nothing to do with God or anything like that, but also has everything to do with God. Uh, in a <laughs> yeah. sense, it was like seeing for a moment through God's eyes rather than Brad's eyes, and also realizing that it, those were the same eyes. <laughs> yeah, that sounds crazy. No, no, I, I think it sounds pretty accurate just from my own experience as well. So would you call yeah. that, uh, let's use the, uh, the E word here, would you call that an enlightenment type experience? You know, I guess it's it fits into that category, but the the problem with the idea of an enlightenment experience as it seems to be conceived by most folks who kind of stand along the fringes of Buddhism or even in Buddhism is that you'll have some kind of great revelation which will download every bit of information there is in the universe and also at the same time turn you into a perfect person. And it wasn't really like that at all. There was no, I was still the same guy I always was after this happened. But I had a different perspective on who that person was, which, which has informed a lot of my choices since then. But it, it doesn't make you incapable of error or anything like that. And it doesn't change who you are fundamentally as an individual. It just sort of gives you a perspective on how your existence as an individual fits in with the bigger picture of of everything and 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 gives you a sense that you have a lot more responsibility than you thought you did <laughs> you know it makes it, it makes it it makes it much harder to sort of point at other people and go, "Oh, those are the bad people who are screwing everything up." Because you realize that you are playing a, a very significant role in shaping everyone's experience in the universe. Oh, God, now it sounds creepy. But, uh, <laughs> but I think it's something like that. I don't think it sounds creepy, man. I think that we don't give the individual enough credit these days in terms of their potential and their power and... The responsibility, I guess, for their role in whatever is happening here, however you define reality. There's a sense of understanding the way in which you actually create the universe. But, but see, if you go too far with some of these ideas, they end up being expressed badly. And then people get into stuff like the secret and all that and the idea that you can kind of, you know, Im imagine a bicycle and get a bicycle. <laughs> I remember reading, leafing through the secret at one point, that book and and seeing it was something like a little kid uh, thinks of getting a bicycle and a bicycle appears in his life. And, and I go, eh, it's not quite like that. <laughs> you know, you're, you're getting this whole idea wrong. But at the same time, it's it's removing this idea that that it's somebody else's fault, uh, which is which I think was very powerful for me and, and going, oh, it's kind of my fault. <laughs> right. you know? Well, hold on. Let me ask you about that bicycle analogy there. So. You know, I've talked to people on the show about things like manifestation uh, yeah. and magic, obviously. Yeah. And uh, there would be some listeners and some former guests who do think that that is real and possible and have admitted that it's happened to them. How do you, I guess, talk to those kind of people? How do you address them? And what's your sort of, let's call it a cosmology in terms of manifestation? Is it not possible to think of a bicycle and then a bicycle appears, you know, a few days later or what? <laughs> I don't I don't think it's quite that simple. I you know and I I think it's there's there's a lot more going on because that 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 idea gets back in in into the idea that as a as an individual you have this will that is that is uh, tremendously powerful or or something. I'm not sure quite what the mechanism is. There there is a sense in which you do create the universe you live in, but it's not as simple as saying, well, I'm going to I'm going to concentrate real hard on this thing that I want and I'm going to get it. I don't know if that's possible or not. I, I've never really tried it, uh, except if you, if you count some of the things that have happened in my life <laughs> where that's happened. But it's always more uh, complicated than that. I, I, for example, I really loved Ultraman as a kid, and I knew that it was made with guys wearing rubber monster costumes and, you know, 
And then I sort of had this childish dream of one day seeing where they made the show. And I pictured a kind of a room with all the monster costumes kind of hanging on, on hooks and, and it having a slanted roof. And, and it was kind of rather specific, the picture I had in my mind. And when I did, when I went to my job interview with Tsuburai Productions, this company that I ended up working for, after the interview was over, the, the guy who ran the company said, would you like a tour of the place? And I'm like, yeah, because I didn't know if I got the job or, or what. So I didn't know if I'd ever have another chance to go there. And he took me up to uh, where they keep the monster costumes. And it looked exactly <laughs> like this thing I'd, I dreamed of as a little kid, which I'd never seen pictures of or anything. And so in a sense, I was like, whoa, mind blown. But in another sense, the idea, I, I don't really like that idea of setting an intention or, or, or sort of dreaming about something that I want and trying to manifest that in reality, because I think, I think I'm not, as an individual, well informed enough to make the right decision and that decision to 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 aim the right direction there you know i mean I'm a, i try to aim in the in, in a direction that is good you know without without kind of getting very specific about that for example if i if i dreamed of being wealthy and sexy or something like that how do i know that once i get wealth and sexiness that that's actually going to be a good thing uh, it might not be mm. a good thing you know for a lot of people it's a terrible thing you know kurt cobain is my favorite go to example of a person who for whom uh, wealth and and fame and uh, you know incredible power were were just a, a tragic combination that led him to kill himself so I, I don't trust my own sort of ideas, uh, my, my own sort of individual ego enough to, to think that I know what's best for me in, in that sense anyway. So, so I just kind of let things happen. Yeah. So, well, there'll be some people that hear that explanation about the, uh, the Ultraman example that you just shared. <laughs> the uh, monster room there, the, the, the or the, the prop room. And they will say like, I mean, I could see that as an example of manifestation, but, um, maybe. <laughs> well, you know, maybe, but what did I manifest? I manifested a room full of rubber monsters. True, yeah. <laughs> or maybe you were just sort of, I don't know, let's get a little out there. Like maybe you were just sort of tapping into a timeline. We can talk about time, you know, if you want to, but you know, maybe you were sort well, of tapping into something and I don't know, I, I don't want to call it like precognition, but I mean, I don't know. Like I'm with you for the most part on that explanation, but I think there is like some significance in that experience that maybe you're not really giving yourself credit for, maybe. Well, one of the reasons that I ended up getting into spirituality to begin with is that, and I haven't, I haven't really written about this much, but it, since childhood, I had had a few experiences that gave me a sense that things weren't the way everybody else believed they were. And and a lot of it falls into the area of something like precognition and 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 all of that. But I, I don't see. I don't. It, none of my precognitive moments have ever been all that valuable. I've never really seen anything that was that was terribly useful. But you know, I would as a record collector, I would just go, ding, go to that store today, and I would go to that store today, and there'd be you know some rare collectible record priced at three dollars and i go oh <laughs> that's interesting but you know as for I, I never i never took it in a direction of trying to predict my life and in fact i i kind of rather not predict my life very much yeah. because uh, you know i don't know too much <laughs> i can agree with that man i don't really want to know what's next for me it's that's kind of spoils the experience i think on some level and it could be something I don't want. So, you know, there's well, sure, always yeah, that. Yeah, you don't want to know if bad news is coming or, you know, when you're going to die, I guess. But So you mentioned Zazen earlier. We haven't really touched on that yet uh, in depth here. And I'd like to sort of flesh out what that is for the listener who's, who's unfamiliar with it. But it goes back to the idea that Zen Buddhism, as you defined earlier, is really just meditation type. Yes. Buddhism and Zazen, I think, is the the central part of that. So, and you do teach this now. So, uh, just yeah. explain 
to the listeners a little bit about what that practice is. We know that Buddha, the original guy, the OG Buddha, taught meditation, but there's a lot of kind of controversy, and there has been for a couple thousand years, about what exactly he taught people to do. So within the Zen sect, the, the conclusion has been that he taught this kind of objectless meditation. And, and like I say, there's other Buddhist sects who will argue about this, but I'm just going to talk for, for Zen. That what he taught was to, to sit in this kind of, the posture is important. So you're, you're sitting in this cross-legged fashion and holding your spine upright so that it's kind of balanced on your hips. And your eyes are open uh, rather than closed. And you're usually trying to be looking in the direction of something that's not very interesting. And in the form of Buddhism that I practice, we look at a wall, you know, because a wall is sort of a reliably non-interesting thing to look at. You know, you're not looking at a mandala or something that, that, that might uh, grab your attention. So you sit in this position, and then and then what you do is what Dogen, who sort of crystallized all this in Japan in the 1200s, he called it shikantaza. And shikantaza is just a fancy Japanese way of saying just sitting. But the, the word just doesn't do it justice <laughs> exactly <laughs> yeah. in English, because it's it's just in the sense of, like, it's not just as like, well, I'm just sitting. It's like just in the sense of just sitting, you know, you're not you're, you're supposed to be doing nothing else but sitting and, and sitting being in, an incredibly boring practice. It's it's hard to remain totally involved in it. But the the goal, if there is one, is to remain totally involved in in just the actual act of sitting still. But but without it, without a. Uh, a sort of mandate to concentrate on anything specifically or to make anything specifically happen in your mind. So whatever happens in your mind, whatever thoughts come by, that's fine. You're not trying to stop your thoughts. You're not trying to have a certain kind of thought. You're just kind of allowing thought. My, my favorite explanation, oh gosh, Uchiyama, he's a, a, he was a, uh, I want to give credit where credit is due. He's a I think he's dead now, but he's a 20th century Zen teacher who said, thoughts are just the secretion of your brain the same way as stomach acid is the secretion of your stomach, which to me says you just, you just regard it the same way. Your stomach is down there in the middle of your body doing its business, and you're not trying most of the time to make it do anything other than what it does. You know, if it wants to digest the cupcake, it digests the cupcake. If it wants to digest the granola bar, <laughs> digest the granola bar. You know, you just let it happen. Uh, and the same thing you do with the organ in the middle of your head, you know, your brain, whatever, whatever is happening up there, you don't try to stop it or force it into a special realm that you want it to go. You just kind of let it happen all the while maintaining this, this posture. And if anything, just observing it as dispassionately as possible, and just letting it kind of all go on. And you do this for a period of however long you set for yourself. The sort of standard within Soto Zen is either 30 or 40 minutes, but people do it for 10 minutes or five minutes sometimes. And there are other people who do it for an hour at a time. And and that's the practice. And, and my first teacher, both of my teachers, in fact, said you should do this twice a day, every day, preferably once in the morning and once at night. And when possible, go on a retreat or something where you'll have uh, several days of uninterrupted zazen where you just kind of keep doing this over and over. You know, you sit for 30 minutes, walk for 10 minutes, sit for 30 minutes, walk for 10 minutes, and you do this for three days or seven days. Those are good as well. But the main practice is to just sit every day and kind of let, let it evolve as it will without trying to make it into something that you want it to be. So what's the learning curve with somebody who's already practiced meditation, maybe on their own, and then they discover Zazen and they come to you, maybe they want to be taught, you know, this more authentic mm. way, I suppose. Is it harder to teach somebody who's already been meditating maybe sort of incorrectly than it is somebody who's never done it? When people come to me and when I do these regular, regularly scheduled Zazen things that I do in Los Angeles, you know, all the time. And then I travel a lot doing them elsewhere. I just teach people what I just told you, you know, I'll demonstrate it physically and show them what it looks like, and then let them get on with it. And if they have difficulties with it, I 
I just expect them to tell me. <laughs> you know, I don't I don't try to correct people in in any way myself. You know, I just tell them this is this is what I'm doing, and if you want to join me in doing this, which is I assume why you're here, then then here's what we're going to do. So I don't really think in terms of of trying to teach somebody who's been doing it another way or or trying to get them to do it right. It's it's up to it's up to the the individual. And if they don't like this style of meditation, then you know it's a free country. I assume they'll just stop showing up, which you know often happens. You yeah, get people yeah, who show up once or twice and then never come back again. So and I don't know what happens to those folks, and and that's fine. Well, I have dabbled in meditation. I find it really difficult sometimes to get into the proper mental space to do it. And sometimes it just doesn't take. And obviously, I'm not I'm not doing zazen. But what sort of advice would you have to people who are interested in just you know maybe not going to a a teacher like yourself, but just want to I guess try it in their own home at their own leisure? What what sort of beginner's advice would you have for people who want to get into it? And I assume it doesn't include Calm or Headspace or any other meditation apps. Yeah, you don't need any of that stuff. I mean, the the great thing about zazen, as opposed to a lot of forms of meditation, is it doesn't really matter what your mental space is. So there's there's no goal of of making it into this or that. So if you if you have a crappy meditation that you're you're just thinking about your I don't know your sister and the ice cream cone she stole from you the entire time, you know that's that's just as good as having the meditation where you're all Wah, you know and one with the universe. In fact, that the one with the sister and the ice cream cone might be actually better in some ways because it's maybe a little bit more real. Uh, as far as beginner's advice. You know, there's there's plenty of tutorials out there. I should probably, I, I have a YouTube channel. Maybe I should put one up myself, which show you how to do Zazen. The reason I haven't done it is because there must be a hundred of them uh, on, on YouTube already for people. And and, and the thing is, uh, it's it takes a, a couple of minutes to show somebody how to do Zazen. That's, that's kind of the interesting genius of it. I've been doing it for 30 odd years now, and I still haven't found the end of it. But what I am doing is the same thing that Tim McCarthy taught me when I was 18, and it took him a minute and a half to teach it to me. So it's it's very very simple. You know the only the only thing I the, the piece of advice that I could give is is just do it whether you feel like it or not. That's that's the kind of thing. A lot of people write to me asking for motivation, and and the only way I've found for me to continue doing it as long as I have been is to forget motivation. You know. I don't I don't really care anymore if I'm particularly motivated to do zazen or not I just do it. And the the only motivation I really have is is early on in my practice I I wasn't terribly committed to it. You know, I didn't come into it and go, "Oh, I'm going to do this for the rest of my life," you know, and I wasn't one of those people. I was just checking it out. And and I did it for a while and I liked it. And then after a while, I kind of went, well, you know, I guess I've done Zen now. It's on to, to the next thing. And I'd get lax and stop doing it. And I started to notice that my my mind got fizzier and and murkier and weirder. And I was more prone to aggression and, and all sorts of things on days when I did not do Zazen than I was on days when I did. And it, And it took me... I don't know, maybe I'm just guessing, but there must have been at least five times, if not more, that I that I decided I was finished with Zazen over the, the years of my, my early years of doing it. And then had this experience of going, oh, what's wrong now? Why is everything so crazy? And then I go, oh, I'm not doing Zazen anymore, am I? And then I go back to doing it. And after a while, I just decided, well, I might as well just keep doing this all the time because because it never made anything any better to stop doing it. But it did make things a little better uh, when I did it. And, you know, these profound changes and stuff that I've written about, those happened a lot later. But more important than those profound changes really were just these little shifts and going, OK, I feel a little bit more all right if I if I do this in the morning. And even even when the doing of it itself doesn't seem particularly wonderful, when I was going through uh, my divorce and and uh, I had this year where my mother died and my grandmother died and I got a divorce and I lost my job all in the same year. And doing zazen during that year was mostly crappy, but I still did it. 
because I realized I would feel more crappy if I didn't do it. So, so I just kept on, you know, kept on doing it. Yeah, man. Whenever I do sit down and do it, I just lose myself in that moment. I, I feel fantastic coming out of that. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, I dropped those names of Calm and Headspace. I have used a couple of meditation apps. I don't really like them. Those are kind of the moments where I, I can't really get into it for some reason. I almost become more distracted by what's going on around me when I'm trying to use those. So I've just stopped using them. But I'm curious, you know, what you think of this sort of rise in meditation apps and classes and things like that, because it might go back to what we started talking about with that sort of commercialized spirituality. I mean, some of it is an attempt by people to make money on, on a market they see opening. But I, I would say most people have at least some kind of sincerity in their approach. So they're not like evil people or anything like that. So I don't want to cast dispersions on it. But I, I think if you think of meditation as being, if you think of the important part of meditation as being having a, a great experience, or or some kind of special experience, then maybe if you use these things, you would have something akin to that. I don't know. But I don't think that's what I'm doing my practice for. It's not for having a, a special experience. So I'm just kind of allowing things to be as they are. And there isn't really... The only thing I use in terms of an app is I got this thing that I downloaded from a place I'd actually spoken at before called Belfast Zen in Belfast, Northern Ireland. And they made this meditation app, but the, all it does is ring a bell and then you, you set how long you want it to, to wait before it rings the bell again. <laughs> you know, and that's all it does. Hmm. It's just a bell at the beginning and a bell at the end. And I really like that one because it works better than, than looking at my watch. But yeah, I don't, I don't, I, I don't use any of those things. I, one time I was up in Montreal and there was a guy I knew there who was very interested in some of this meditation technology. So he asked me to, to check it out and tell him what I thought of it. And I tried a few of these devices and, and I, I found most of them kind of annoying. They, they seemed like more interruptions in what I was trying to do than, than any sort of help in it. So that was the only time I ever tried any of these things. Yeah, I think the best one I used was called Oak, O-A-K. It's fairly new mm -hmm. still. I don't know if you've heard of that one. No. But uh, it's, it's a guided meditation app. Uh, I would recommend it. It's, I believe it's free. It's only available for iOS, but not to make that a whole you know thing here. I'm not trying to <laughs> market for them, obviously. You know, one of the things that you sort of hinted at, touched on a little bit, in your book, and then I've heard you sort of talk about over the years, is the role that trauma may play in the whole spiritual process. And I was just curious where you're at these days with that idea, because I've told people that I sort of came to where I was at a couple years ago when I first got into what I would call the occult, uh, sort of alternative spirituality. I came to that okay. after traumatic experience, and then when I looked back on my life, I realized that I'd had many traumatic experiences that were that went sort of unaddressed that go back to my childhood. Mm -hmm. And it's been all just sort of an amalgamation that's led me to this point. And I've been trying to work through that, you know, just on my own, obviously. But I'm curious, you know, if you see that as a common theme, that trauma does sort of open up pathways to these more, let's just, I guess we'll stick with the word alternative spiritualities. Do you feel like this is a common theme? Yeah, I meet a lot of people who get into it because of, of something traumatic that happened in their lives. And, and yeah, that is a, a common theme. And it's, it's kind of, it often pushes people uh, in, in a direction where they start going, well, I got to figure things out because this, this terrible thing happened. I, you know, in, in my own case, I think the trauma was a little bit, a little bit less like getting hit by a bus. Uh, and more like this slow moving train that you realized uh, I got to do something about this slow moving train, you know, in, in the sense that I discovered or were, was informed when I was a teenager that there was a, a the disease that ran in our family, a genetic disease that I had a 50 percent chance of inheriting uh, that might kill me by the time I reached my my early 40s. <laughs> you know, and I, I learned this when I was like 15 or 16. And I went, oh, that's nice to know. So I guess it was a bit of a, it wasn't, it wasn't like a big disaster, but it was just kind of like, oh, I got this time, you know, you have a time bomb in you. And it seems, although I can't say for sure because of the nature of the illness, I'm, I'm in my 50s now and nothing has happened, so I'm probably clear. But this continues to inform a lot of my, 
of, of my life was, was learning that was a very real possibility. So I think a lot of people come to it from that and they, and they process that in, in different ways. One of the things that can happen, which is one of the sort of dangers, possible dangers of meditation, although using the word danger probably makes it sound worse than it really is. One of the hazards or risks of meditation is that if you become very, very quiet, a lot of that trauma has a, a, a chance to kind of reappear in your mind in whatever way it will appear. And this happens to people sometimes. And, and sometimes they have a bad time with meditation. It's one of the reasons I'm kind of against these meditate quick schemes that are kind of appearing here and there these days where people will say, well, my meditation will have effects faster than the others, you know, and then, and, and then they encourage you to get into these. I, I think when you're, when I talk about shikantaza and just sitting, people kind of go, oh, that's just going to be boring. And, and as a matter of fact, generally for most people, when they start out, it is in fact terribly boring. You know, there's, there's almost nothing happens. You just feel like, oh, I just sat here for 30 minutes and, and now I'm getting up. But one of the reasons we do it that way is that if you do it that way for long enough, you're going to get into those deep places in your mind and in your spirit or however you want to define it. And if you go into those spaces slowly, the possibility that it's going to freak you out becomes less because you, you kind of, you know, you wade into the pool a little bit and then go, oh, this is too deep for me. And you wade back out. Well, a lot of these more trendy sort of meditation processes that people are advertising are, are like, you know, we're just going to plunge you into the depth right now, <laughs> get your experience fast. And sometimes that becomes a very pleasant experience that opens your eyes to the loveliness of the universe and all of that. But if you've got some dark stuff buried in your past, it's probably not going to be that way. You're, you're going to be plunged into your, your dark past and, and you won't be prepared for it most of the time unless you've gone into it very, very slowly. And people who have a traumatic experience or something that's kind of there in their past that's uh, that's was bad will often see these these things kind of manifest themselves again. And and if you have a competent teacher and if you're taking it slowly, even that doesn't need to be a big problem. Uh, the teacher will will everybody who's practiced meditation for long enough to become a teacher or at least a, a competent teacher will know the drill that that uh, things like this do happen and and will be able to say well you know when it happened to me <laughs> here's what i did and and maybe give you a little good advice so i don't know a lot i do meet a lot of people who got into meditation because of something something traumatic yeah so brad warner before Thanks. we get going tell people where they can keep up with your work if they're interested and where they can find your books well, the main thing, to, the main place to keep up with me online is hardcorezen.info. Uh, I couldn't get .com, so I got .info, info. So it's Hardcore Zen, like the title of my first book, .info. And I have a blog there, and there's links to where to get the books and, and the, the YouTube page that I maintain and all sorts of things are all linked from that central hub. And, uh, you know, my books aren't that hard to find. If you, if you go to a reasonably well-stocked bookseller and ask for them, they've either got a few on hand or they can order them. They're not that obscure, <laughs> thankfully. <laughs> for um, sure, yeah. So, so I'm out there. <laughs> Definitely, yeah. And, uh, you know, we just really scratched the surface here, Brad, on, on Buddhism and some of the ideas that, that we could have talked about. So, I mean, you're welcome back anytime to dig further into that and some of your more recent work as well. So, it's been a real pleasure, man. Yeah, thank you. It's been it's been good for me too. I appreciate it. And there you have it. My thanks again to Brad Warner. Really dig and appreciate the cut of his jib and his approach to not only Buddhism but spirituality in general. And of course, some of you will agree with Brad's take on these subjects and some won't, and that's okay. I'm just trying to provoke critical thought. And speaking of thought, I did enjoy Brad's analogy of brain and thought to stomach and stomach acid, if you recall that. 
The idea that secreting thoughts is just what the brain does and we shouldn't get too caught up in it is, I don't know, I think a valuable analogy and valuable advice, particularly to anyone struggling with negative thought patterns, which I surely have been a victim of myself uh, for quite some time. In the Patreon extension, Brad and I discussed psychedelics in Buddhism and drug-based spirituality. Brad's pretty outspoken on that topic, as you might imagine. We also talked encountering demons during meditation, conspiracy thinking, the self-image as a useful fiction, teaching Buddhism in the same way you teach art, and the quote, from birth to death, it's just like this. And a shout out to new patrons Michael V, Caroline, and Nora, and a huge thank you to Celia and Michael W, who became official executive producers of the show. If you're interested in joining these fine folks on board this esoteric endeavor, patreon.com slash occulture is your launch point. Four levels of support starting at just two bucks a month. And I don't want to jinx anything, but 2019 may be the year I am able to start scaling back on that dreaded full-time day job and focus more of my time and energy on this project, which means longer episodes, longer Patreon extensions, more bonus content, more experimentation, because you know I love that shit, uh, more storytelling, more of whatever it is you enjoy about this. I mean, I am itching to get to that point of my life where I can just leave that job behind and do this for y'all full time. But this is a fully listener-supported show, and it continues to stay on the air because of you and your generosity. So if you want me to up my game, believe me, I do too. Also, Wednesday night, December 26th, the night after the Christmas holiday, a patron-only chat, or Culture After Dark, 11 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. Pacific, 4 a.m. GMT. Sorry, GMT folks. But if you're around after the holidays and want to get away from your family for a few minutes, let's hang out for a bit. I'll post a link to a Zoom chat on Patreon so we can hang out and complain about how many pairs of socks we received the day before. You will hear from me again before then, though, as long as I can find the time to finish the next episode, which I have to, actually, because it's quite seasonal. So until then, you've just been initiated into a culture. I am Ryan Peverly reminding you... To love yourself, think for yourself, and question authority. Please rewind this cassette.